Chapter 11. The trail through Potomagon was steep. The new sled flew like a freight, frightened bird at the bottom of the pass just as they skimmed out of the grove of spruce trees i saw something strange on the trail snow was falling and at first i thought it was a pile of rocks covered by brush as i drew closer the rocks turned into trees then into shaggy beast i thought it was a caribou then i saw the spreading horns and the long lumpy nose it was a moose, a bull moose, big and red-eyed. Moose are always dangerous. They are big and bad-tempered. Oteg was far behind, and if I waited for him, it would he would come and help me. I would lose all the time that I had gained. I did not dare to challenge the beast. Once when I was with my father, we met a young bull near Blue Goose Village. It was standing in the middle of the trail, swinging its head back and forth. It does not wish to move, Bartog said. I don't blame him, I said. The trail is easier to walk on than the deep snow. And what's more, it is not going to move. It weighs most of 700 pounds, so we are not going to make him move. We can try. Remember old Ekalak? He tried <clears throat> one time and lost three of his dogs and came close to losing his life. I have my gun, but since my eyes went bad, I am a poor shot. If I only wound the beast, it will come at us. He unhitched Black Star and the rest of the team. He turned the sled around and hitched the dogs again, and we went back, nearly out of sight, and waited. We waited most of an hour until the beast decided to move away. What had happened in Ekaluk, I did not want to happen to me. Oteg had good advice about passing dog teams, but not about passing a moose. I stepped down on the brake and shouted, whoa, to Black Star when the team came to a halt. I was so close to the animal, I could hear it breathing. Its head was lowered and it stared at me with its yellow eyes. Quietly, <clears throat> I put on my snowshoes. I made a half circle around the moose, leaving a trail in the snow that was deep enough to run on. The dogs were barking, straining at their leashes in a frenzy to get at the beast. They did not budge when I yelled, go. I had to crack the long black wick over their heads before they would take the trail. They barked until the moose was out of sight behind us. It stopped snowing and a weak sun came out, but the wind still blew hard from the north. I passed two teams camped beside the trail. Close to dusk, I came upon a third team. The driver was pulled up behind some trees, feeding his dogs. He raised a hand and shouted, Watch for the moose! Two big ones just trotted by! He pointed down the trail to Roan. I'd wait, young lady. You can get into trouble, he shouted. I just passed one, I shouted back, thinking that he was not warning me, but trying to slow me down. But in a short time, as the trail climbed a hill and went down again over a bridge of frozen stream, I saw the moose and the ones the driver had warned me about. There were two of them, as he had said, a bull and a cow. The bull was big. Each of my dogs weighed over 70 pounds. The bull looked bigger than all of them put together. When she heard the dogs bark, the cow took on the stream and disappeared. But the bull stood sideways on the bridge and did not move. I pulled up the teams as soon as I was sure that he meant to stay there. Off to the right of the bridge, we patched of earth and rocks where the wind had swept the snow clean. I shouted, gee, for the right turn, then hop for left turns, and Black Star picked his way through the clean patches. When we were safely on the trail again, I glanced back at the bull. He had moved from the bridge. He was slowly trotting after us, swinging his head from side to side. I cracked the whip and team leapt forward, but 
As we picked up speed, the bull did not stop, and I saw that he was chasing us. In a long run, my dogs could outdistance him. They can cover close to 20 miles an hour, but in a short run, moose could run much faster. They run at a gallop, thrusting their leg, thin legs ahead of their bodies, two powerful legs at a time. I was scared. I jumped off the sled to make it easier for the dogs. The moose rushed up and ran beside me. For a moment, I thought that he was showing off, playing some sort of wild game. Then he ran past me and galloped along the line of dogs, brushing them off of the trail with his broad antlers. He galloped on and disappeared over the bro brow of the hill. My dogs were barking, trying to get out of their harnesses to chase him. So I waited for a while to calm them down and let the bull gallop out of sight. But when we started up again and came to a bro, brow of the hill, he was waiting. He stood in the middle of the trail, his long, queer-shaped nose raised to the wind, and his yellow eyes fixed on us. We were in the drawn with boulders on both sides of the trail. There was no way to get around the beast but room to turn around. I made the turn and waited beyond the hill for Oteg, for one of the drivers for help to come. No sooner than I clambered the dogs against that the bull appeared on the brow of the hill. He stood for a moment looking down at us, pawing the snow. With one sweep of his antlers, he would kill half of the team. With his sharp hooves, he could injure the rest. I did a desperate thing. As the bull started towards us, I ran down the tow line, loosened the buckles, and freed all the dogs. It was better than they run and hide to save themselves as best they could than to be caught tied to a tow line. Black Star raised his head, growled, and moved slowly up the rise to meet the bull. The rest of the dogs followed. The sled was small protection, yet I stood behind it. Not long before I had felt the biting wind, I felt it no longer. Black Star circled the bull once, twice, three times, drawing closer each time. On the last circle, the beast caught him a glance, bl glancing blow with one of his horn back hooves and sent him sprawling. Black Star shook the snow out of his eyes, got up and stalked the bull again. Now all of my dogs sent up chilling howls and joined him. The bull snorted, made sounds like far off thunder and slashed out with his sharp hooves. He hovered around and round. He tried to face all of the dogs at once, but failed. Then he made a dash for the sky and gave her a slashing blow with both of his front hooves. I took off my parka, ran up the trail, and waved it frantically. A foolish thing to do, yet it saved us. The moose forgot he was surrounded by growling dogs. For a moment, his blazing eyes examined me and the parka. In the brief time, Black Star sunk his teeth into the beast's throat. In a flash, the other dogs were on him. The moose fell to his knees and rolled over. He tried to shed the dogs, but they clung to him until he lay still. I wrapped Skye in my heavy parka and laid her on the sled. She was scarcely breathing. I rounded up the dogs and fastened them to a tow line and started for Rome. It was getting dark. The trail was hard to see, but I turned on my headlamp and went fast. Chapter 12. <clears throat> it was past three in the morning when I came to Rome. A north wind was blowing. I anchored the sled and took Skye in my arms. She seemed better, but when I got her to the cabin and we when 
<clears throat> but when I got her to the cabin, this was all of Rome, a cabin beside the trail, and the veterinarian looked at her. He said that she had three broken ribs. He gave her something, and she went to sleep. Oteg came in more than an hour after I did. He had lost the trail out in Patagamigan and ended up in a swamp. How many teams did you pass, he asked. Four. He clapped my hands. Pass four today. I stay close. No more swamps. We push the leaders not too fast, not too slow. To the others, we give serious thought. And all the time, we keep the dogs strong. Dogs win the race. I told him about the moose. They are worse than blizzards, he said, and the trails you cannot find in the snow, holes in the ice and swamps. Moose are the worst, but today you need not worry about them. I will speak to my friend, the raven. A big fire was going in the cabin. He shouldered his way through the crowd of mushers, warmed his hands at the fire, and went outside. When he came back, he said that he had spoken a few words to Raven. The stars were dim, and there was a small moon. I cooked food for the team, stocked, <clears throat> staked it out away from the other teams, and changed the boots on all of the dogs that needed them. Then I crawled into the sleeping bag, slept until dawn, and went to see about my injured dog. She was awake, but did not want to fish, want the fish I had brought her, or any of the meat on the plane that the plane had dropped, or the rice or blueberry cakes I had stored away for myself. Do you want to go? I said in a voice I used on the trail. She cocked her ears. She looked up at me for a moment, then closed her eyes. The morning had dawned clear and cold. I could hear the drivers talking to their dogs. The first teams were leaving. Oteg came in and wanted to know if I was ready. Twelve teams have gone, he said. I am hitched, but still you moon over the dog. He was angry. I said nothing and went out and told the marshal that I wanted to send my dog back to Anchorage. He said a plane was due when I asked, in an hour depending on the wind. Oteg had followed me. He guessed that I meant to wait and put my dog on the plane. You do not win races this way, he said. Maybe the plane come in an hour, maybe in two hours, maybe tomorrow, who knows? The marshal said the veterinarian will take care of your dog and all see that she gets on the plane. I thanked him and said that I would wait for the plane. He gave me a quick glance and shook his head. Silently, Oteg left the cabin. I heard him shouting at his dogs. The crack of a whip and the squeal of the runners. The plane landed in less than an hour. I wrapped Skye in a blanket. Mr. McCall gave her a pill and I put her on a plane. Will they take care of Skye when she gets to Anchorage? I asked him. She'll have a better time than pulling a sled. Mr. McCall did not know that she would rather pull a sled than eat. I got the rest of the team ready and we let, left before noon. The sky was gray, but it had stopped snowing. I caught up with Oteg. He pulled off the trail so that I could pass. He had gotten over his anger and shouted more advice. I did not listen. He had taught me many things about the race, but it was Oteg who was racing in the Iditarod, not me. I remember my father's words. He said, do not depend on other people, on me, on your teachers and school, on anyone. Listen and think about what you hear, but depending upon yourself, from now on, I would try not to depend on Oteg so much. It seemed strange driving the team without Sky. The team missed her too. She sang a lot, even when they were going up hills and the snow was deep. The afternoon turned cold. Sharp pebbles covered the trail. 
There were hard as the dog on the dog's feet. I stopped twice to feed them bits of frozen meat and change their boots. At dusk, I came to the farewell burn. Oteg had told me about the farewell burn. It was thousands of acres that a fire had swept through. Stumps of burned trees rose everywhere along the trails. A thin sheet of snow covered them like shrouds in the dim light. They looked like rows of ghostly heads. Oteg had warned me to go slow through the burn, to watch closely for stumps. Instead, now that I was running the race in my own way, I drove faster than I should have. I hit one of the stumps and broke off a piece of both of the runners. I drove slower after that and Oteg passed me. I got to Nikolai and the next checkpoint at two in the morning, almost an hour after he did. It was blowing again and the wind turned into a blizzard. The thermometer fell way below zero. You could not see beyond your feet. A freeze was called and not a team stirred that day. During this time, Oteg built another igloo or rather we built it together. This time at his prompting, I stood inside. He handed me the blocks of snow and I put them down in the circle and slanted the edges to make the dome. It was not so good as the igloo that we had made in Rainy Pass, but it kept out the fierce wind. The freeze helped. I could not race on broken runners. New ones were not to be found in the Nikolai, but Oteg poked through his bundle and found two lengths of spruce, which he fitted to the runners and bound with caribou sinew. I will now make the runners smooth, both of them, he said. Now you will fly. He took out a blob of frozen mud and heated it over the lamp. When it was soft, he went outside and smeared it over the runner and let it freeze again. With his knife, he trimmed the mud smooth. Last, he filled his mouth with water and let it warm. When he moved up and down the overturned sled with a piece of wet deer skin sprayed and wiping the runners. They froze in a second. Try it now, he said. I put my hand on the sled and it moved easily. Try one finger. I touched the finger to the sled. It glided away. I, I, he crowed. When crowed, when we leave Nikolai, we will go a little faster than before. We will pass some teams this time. I nodded and thanked him for saving the sled. Just before dawn, at the lull in the screaming winds, I heard the wolf sound again. The sound I had heard in Skawanta. I went outside. All of the dogs except Black Star were buried in the snow. He was on his feet, sniffing the air. His head was turned towards a grove of trees. Beyond the trees, through the driving ice and snow, I made out the white wolf. He was standing with the, his pack bunched together. They were watching us and not making a sound. Black Star was chained to a tow line. I untied the chain, let him into the igloo, and set the snow block in place. For a short time, I dozed and woke to find him clawing at the doorway. I sat up and listened. The wolves had come closer. They seemed to be just outside the igloo, among the sleeping dogs. Oteg crawled out of his bag. He put a chunk of seal oil in the lamp and set water to boil for his black tea. The wolves are outside, I said. I have heard them, Oteg said. They are looking for food. They'll find none and go away. It's the same wolf pack I saw before. The leader is white. He is one I saw in <coughs> Squintana. He's not just looking for food. You saw the white one this morning. Oteg sighed. It's Raven again. I'll attend to him after a while. He put on his boots. He poured himself a mug of tea. He drank it and poured more. Then he got into his parka and left the igloo. 
He was gone for a long time. I went outside holding Black Star on his chain. Day was breaking. Oteg stood with his mug of tea, looking at the sky. It is very good, he said. The sky was pink in the east. Bands of lavender shifted back and forth overhead, fading out and returning to shades of orange and yellow. Where are the wolves? I asked him. <clears throat> he had forgotten about the wolves. He sipped his tea and gazed at the beautiful sky. The wolves, I said, what happened to them? He drank his tea and kept admiring the sky. Chapter 13. We left Nikali, Nikolai the next morning when the sun came up and got to McGrath at dusk. We camped there past midnight, looked out the dogs, slept some, and started off to Tokona and Ophir and Iditarod. Oteg said, the driver who gets to Iditarod first wins $2,000 in silver money. That is a good prize, $2,000, but I cannot win. I am too far back. Let the others scramble and wear out their dogs in what I think. What do you think? It was the only time he had ever asked my opinion about anything. The new sled flies. The dogs are fine. $2,000 is a lot of money, Mr. Oteg. I am going to try for it. Well, he was disappointed, but he gave me a thin smile and wished me luck. The dogs strained at their traces. They started off with the mighty rush. The runners swang, sang. It was a dark night. Not a star showed. Far from the west, a pale moon went down. I passed six teams on the way to Tokatana. On my way to Afir, eight teams. Now I was running ninth. Beyond Ophir, the mushers ahead of me had stopped at the checkpoint called Don's Cabin. Warm light shone through the windows, and I heard loud voices and laughter. It was very cold outside, but as soon as I checked in, I climbed back on the sled and headed down the trail for Iditarod. We <clears throat> all had left Ophir according to the times that we got there, also our places in the race. At every checkpoint, these staggered stars were used. In this way, every musher could keep the advantage he or she had earned. The country beyond Don's cabin looked wild and forsaken. Scattered trees had ragged the, and bent over their fierce winds. It was very cold. My feet stuck to the runners. They felt as if they belonged to somebody else. I drove the teams faster than I had ever done before. At times we were running at 15 miles an hour. The dogs opened their jaws and scooped up snow as they ran. I stopped and fed them snacks often enough to keep them happy. No one was ahead of me. Not one of the eight drivers I had left at Don's cabin had overtaken me. Yet I had no idea how much time I had gained on them or where I stood now in the race. Surely I was close to second or third. Iditarod is a ghost town, just a few shacks left over from the gold rush when 10,000 people lived there. As I drove in and put on my brakes, sending up a shower of snow, a marshal came out to greet me. He looked at his watch, put down fingers in a book and talked to people. There was a long wait, then a man came out and said, congratulations, you're the first driver to reach Iditarod. You are the winner of the $2,000. I couldn't be the winner, but here I was. I felt giddy in the head. I had never earned more than $50 making and selling mule skins. I tried to say a little speech. All I could say was thank you. The race was not over. As soon as I could leave politely, I thanked everyone again and left. I was tired and the dogs were tired, too tired to go faster than three miles an hour. The trail would 
wound through steep hills straight up and straight down. Going up, I had to get off and push hard on the sled to help the dogs. Going down, I had to press hard on the brake and the rubber mat. Twice, I put out the snow hook. Once, I ran off the trail. Then the sled turned over and I lost nearly an hour. Oteg caught up with me and helped set it back on the trail and get the dog's harness straightened out. Seven teams passed me before Oteg came. I was glad to reach Shingluk, a village on the Inoko River. School was out and a band of children and their teachers came and asked if I would like to take a bath in the schoolhouse. I hadn't had a bath since I left Anchorage. It was a wonderful invitation, but then I thought about how awful it would be to have it, to crawl back into a half frozen clothes. Then I changed my mind and used up all of the school's hot water. Oteg didn't believe in bass. Water, he said, it's bad. It washes you away, bits at a time, not good. While I was getting into warm clothes, he cooked soup for the dogs and the caribou steak for us, which he brought from the villagers. It was the first real food I had eaten in days. I was so tired that I had eaten only chocolate bars, five or six of them every day, and spoonfuls of Eskimo ice cream. After Shangluk, it got very cold, much below zero. My eyelashes gathered fr frost. They began to feel like splinters. I had a hard time seeing and had to depend on Black Star. I was traveling at a good five or six miles an hour, well ahead of Oteg, on a lagoon formed by the Inoko River when the trail began to tremble. At once I realized that we were on ice, thin ice, no more than a couple of inches thick. Ahead of us, it was billowing like waves on the sea. Black Star saw the billows too and stopped the dogs. If we went on, the whole team, all of us would go crashing down into the rushing river. We couldn't turn and go back because now the ice behind us had started to billow. We were trapped. Panic seized me. I took a deep breath and tried to calm myself. Black Star stood with his ears curled back tight Go to the right or to the left. I was no help. I didn't know what to do. It was Black Star's decision. At last, he turned to the left towards the line of trees that marked the shore. He went slowly and the team followed him. The ice grew thinner. It creaked beneath the weight of the sled. I got off the runners and walked to lighten the heavy load. We went along towards the trees. Through the ice, I could see fish swimming and blue water racing over the rocks. Black Star seemed to be sure where he was going. His head was up and his ears alert. His bushy tail curled high over his back. The rest of the team were dragging their tails. Every few steps, they wanted to stop. We were close to the shore now, but the ice thinner and full of bubbles. Suddenly, Black Star pulled on, pulled up. He glanced in both directions, trying to decide where best to make for the shore. The willow trees were, that marked it ran in a straight line. After a moment, he moved ahead in the same direction. We had been going. Slowly, he gathered speed. Then, with the bank only a few yards away, he made a dash and scrambled safely to shore. The next five dogs followed him, then the ice broke and the rest of the team fell through into the swirling water. The sled went with them and I went with the sled. Dazed and blinded, I held tight to the handlebars and the dogs were struggling against the current, their heads up and silent. 
there was a gray mist along the trees, but I had a glimpse of the leader. He and his five dogs were pulling on the tow line. With all my strength, I shouted, go Black Star, go! The dogs crawled their way out of the water and up the bank. The sled got caught on a willow root. All of the team was pulling now and we were able to get the sled free. I staked the dogs out among the willows, built a fire in the cooker, and fed them some thick soup. I was a sheet of ice, shivering and blue with cold. It took me a long time to peel off my frozen clothes and get into warm ones. I sat down on the cooker and was half thawed out when Oteg came racing through the trees. I saw your tracks, he said. You took a wrong turn. You went right instead of left. I remembered now that he had told me to go left. You lost an hour, he said. I forgot. Too bad. He set out a pan of snow to boil water. From here to Anvik, he said, we will be going through a forest. Only one trail to Anvik. It is a narrow trail. Crooked too. We go slow, huh? He made himself a pot of tea. He stared, <clears throat> stared to harness the dogs, started to harness the dogs. You better sleep before you go, he said. You need sharp eyes on the anvil track trail. I harnessed the dogs and packed the sled. Oteg was drinking with his bitter tea when I left. The night was still. The forest was close on both sides. I felt as if I were traveling in the darkness. All of the trees turned. All of the trees looked the same. They stood up tall and straight like soldiers. Then the soldiers melted together. I was driving between two high walls. I looked up but saw no stars. I began to nod. I got off the sled and trotted to wake myself. There were some teams ahead of me, so the trail was packed hard. My boots made weird sounds on the hard snow. The team was running better than 10 miles an hour when they were glad to be out of the river dry again. I grew tired at the place, pace and got back on the sled which slowed the team down by half. We left the forest and were now in the open country with far off hills on the horizon and the moon. A strong headwind was blowing by the temperature, but the temperature was well above zero. I took off my parka and gloves and opened my sweater. Still, I was warm. The slick runner made whispering sounds. The dogs ran together in long loping strides. They made scarcely a sound in the snow. They were tired. I didn't push them. The moon and the hills became a hazy blur. I began to nod once more. I was drifting down a broad river filled with salmon. Their golden scales glittered in the moonlight. They were leaping out of the water. They were trying to tell me something. One word over and over, the dream suddenly faded. Again, I was on the sled, moving through the night. I glanced over my shoulder. A team had slipped up behind me. The musher lamp sent the blinking glare. It was Oteg. Trail, he shouted, trail. I pulled my dogs over and let him pass. I have followed bright dawn for two miles, he said as he went by. She slept like a baby, but we do not sleep on the trail. If we do not, if we do sleep, we may never wake up. He hadn't yet congratulated me on winning the $2,000. He cracked his long reindeer whip and was gone. He left a snowy mist in the night. His headlamp glowed far down the trail in the streaks of yellow gold. At last, I thought that he had set me free to race my own race. It felt good to be free, but lonesome too and scary.